Welcome everyone to this evening's public event hosted by LSC Ideas on the integrated review towards a conclusion. My name is Karen Smith and I'm the head of the Department of International Relations here at the LSC and I'll be chairing tonight's event. So the UK government is now finalizing its integrated review of the country's foreign security, defense and international development policy. It was first announced in the Queen's speech in December 2019. Its purpose is to define the government's vision for the UK's role in the world over the next decade. And the review is, going to, is supposed to set out the long-term strategic aims of the UK's international policy and national security. The review will consider how the UK can fulfill certain high-level outcomes, including a more resilient open UK and a more resilient world, a secure, prosperous, and stable Euro-Atlantic neighborhood, strong science, data, and technology capabilities, and a reformed and refocused approach to defense. Tonight's event will discuss the integrated review, addressing questions such as, what are the fundamental changes in the international and domestic context which have prompted this review? How can we assess the review? In other words, how can we judge how realistic and effective it could be? And how should the review address the fundamental issue of national resilience? We have a distinguished panel of three eminent experts on British foreign and security policy to look at these issues. Christopher Coker is director of LSE Ideas and was formerly a professor of international relations here at the LSE. Peter Watkins is a visiting senior fellow with LSE Ideas and an associate fellow with Chatham House. And Susan Schofield is a member of the LSE Economy, Economic, excuse me, Economic Diplomacy Commission and visiting professor of politics at the University of Surrey. Each of our panelists will speak for about eight minutes. We'll then launch a discussion among the panelists and then I'll invite questions from the audience. So please send your questions to the panelists via the Q&A function and we'll try to get through as many as possible before 7.45 p.m. when this event ends. If you'd like to tweet about the event, please use the hashtag LSC Integrated Review. And we are recording this event to be made into a podcast. So without further ado, I'll turn to our first panelist, who's Christopher Coker. Christopher. Is this right? Can you hear me? No? Yeah, you're, you're good. Chris. You can. Okay, thank you very much. I'm getting conflicted uh, messages on, on the screen. Um, the government has um, announced that this is going to be, and I quote, the deepest and most radical review of uh, UK security and foreign policy since the end of the Cold War. So the first question we have to ask ourselves is why the need for this review? And I think the answer is that we're living in a very different world from the world of, say, 15 years ago. Compare the preamble to the European Union's global strategy in 2016, in which you will find the words, we live in times of existential crisis, with a rather more comforting preamble to the first global strategy that the EU ever um, adopted in 2003, which began with the words, Europe has never been safer. So we have to ask ourselves what's happened in the meantime. And I think what's happened is we've rediscovered history. And the end of the Cold War coincided with a thesis advanced by Francis Fukuyama in the United States called the end of history. History, of course, did not end in uh, 1989. Um, but what did end, apparently, was the study of history, particularly by the kind of bien pensant uh, intellectuals who came up with radically new ideas, a radical new idea such as uh, globalization, was irreversible. Although in the 1930s, it had indeed been arrested and reversed. And politicians who had absolutely no idea of history because they had no knowledge of it. Um, I think of the uh, Cool Britannia Brigade as being an excellent example of this. History is so passe, so unimportant. So we've rediscovered um, in the last uh, 10 years or so that history is important and that it has lessons. And I think this review is trying to address the lessons of, of history, 
that we've ignored. So I want to make three points in the uh, remaining time that is available to me. The first is that great power conflict has returned and with it, the study of geopolitics. But we find ourselves at an invidious moment, unfortunately, in time. Uh, to quote the national uh, uh, security strategy of the United States last year, we're heading into an era of global competition for which the West is unprepared. And I would say that one of the things that should inform this uh, review is that the United States is facing the same dilemma as Imperial Germany in 1913. Imperial Germany was a country that was too big for Europe, but too small for the world. In other words, it could attain a hegemonic influence in Europe, which it tried to do in 1914, the following year, by going to war, but it could never rival the two budding superpowers that were off stage, Russia and the United States. And I would suggest the United States is no longer the hegemonic power in the world, but it is still immensely strong and indeed stronger than any other country. And what we're seeing now, and what I think we've woken up to, is that the Russians and Chinese in particular are stress testing the alliances and commitments to which the United States has entered. Uh, whether the Chinese uh, are stress testing uh, uh, the alliances uh, the United States has with Taiwan, or the Russia is stress testing the West's response to Ukraine or to Crimea, or the Chinese are stress testing some principles like freedom of navigation in the South China Seas, which are meant to be absolutely central to the liberal world order to which the United Kingdom, like all other Western countries, is totally committed. The second point I would make is that technology has been the key driver of international conflict since the 1890s, which is the first time that we saw an arms race in history. The new buzzwords today are cyber, hypersonic, uh, hybrid, Space is being militarized, and artificial intelligence, of course, is going to become increasingly important. Indeed, we've seen the beginning of an AI race between China and the United States, and it's by no means clear that the United States will win that race. What cyber and hybrid have done in particular is to transform, once again, the character of war, which is always changing. Another word I could have used, another term I could have used, is information warfare. And we've seen Russian attempts to undermine the government's credibility in the COVID response. But the Russians have tried to undermine every Western government's response to COVID. And this has been detailed in great length by the EU's External Action Service. The documents are, are there online. So I think we're living in what Lucas Kello, uh, who is a cyber expert at uh, Oxford, calls a unique period in hi of history, a period of unpeace. A period in which it is very difficult for the first time to tell the difference between war and peace. That is what is radical about the world that we're living in today. And that is what the government is trying to address in this radical review. The third and the most important, I think, fact that I want to mention today before I conclude, which COVID has illustrated all too well, is the importance of world order just at a time when the liberal world order that many of us taken for granted is disintegrating and crumbling away. Germany's uh, foreign minister last year, I quote, the world order we felt comfortable in no longer exists. And we face the prospect instead of what uh, the head of the Eurasia group in Bremer, in a book he published a few years ago, calls a G0 world. This is a world in which there is no governance, a world in which there's no court of world opinion, a world in which global civil society has had its day. And why this is critical is that we need global governments and we need civil society more than we've ever done before because of the twin threats that we're facing of global warming and pandemics. In fact, they're not twin threats. Uh, pandemics are actually a subset of global warming. And global warming has struck 10 or 20 years earlier than scientists predicted 20 years ago. Whereas the four year drought in Syria, which precipitated the uh, present uh, civil war, whether it's the opening of the Arctic to geopolitical competition, whether it's migration from Africa, which President Macron last year described rather dramatically as a threat to European civilization. And the pandemic is an example, I think, of how we have to redefine national security 
to take into account things that we didn't take into account in the past defense reviews that Peter will be referring to in a moment. I think the COVID crisis has found us living in two worlds, a, a Westphalian world of great power politics, uh, renewed and reinvigorated, uh, with people playing geopolitical games, and a post-Westphalian world of climate change and global pandemics, which requires greater cooperation um, than we've seen before in history by the international community, and which we saw once before with the SARS epidemic in 2003, which let me remind you, within a month could have become the global catastrophe that we face today. And the reason why SARS didn't was because in 2003, in this nice, comfy post-Cold War world in which we lived, there was far greater global cooperation than there was at the time of COVID last year when it first manifested itself. There have been three major outbreaks of disease in the last five years, uh, Ebola, MERS, and Zika. And the degree of international cooperation in each of these three has been lamentable, according to the WHO, compared with the response to SARS in 2003. So that is the post-Westphalian world. And this is why uh, SARS was described by David Fidler, a uh, health uh, authority, as the post first post-Westphalian pathogen. The first pathogen that required a post-Westphalian response, but we haven't got this post Westphalian world. And indeed, we have now an attack on interdependence, an attack on globalization, an attack uh, on uh, cooperation, whether it's in the form of Brexit, whether it's in the form of uh, Modi in India, Trump in the United States, uh, etc., etc. At this critical moment, nationalism is becoming the prevailing and dominant force in so many countries, from Russia to China to the United States. And most of ironic of all, of course, is the pandemic has actually accelerated geopolitics. If you look at the degree to which there's now a competition over who gets the vaccine first and whether countries are really willing to cooperate with each other in getting a vaccine that is available to everyone. So in this uh, febrile environment, trust is declining very fast. And we relied at the end of the Cold War with the end of what we thought was ideology on trust between the great powers. And it's now in very short supply. And I think this is the radical situation which we find ourselves, which requires a radical response by all governments, including this one. Whether we'll get it in this review or not, of course, is a completely different matter. Thank you, Karen. Excellent, after that rather, um, yes, chat, uh, somewhat depressing uh, list of the challenges that uh, of the current context. Well, I'll turn over now to Peter Watkins, who's going to talk about um, how we might be able to assess the extent to which this review will address some of those, be able to address those kinds of challenges. Peter? So thank you, Karen. And um, I'd like to pick up where Christopher left off. So <clears throat> I don't think there's any disputing that the fundamental changes which he outlined um, justify the need for what Ben Wallace called would be, or what Ben Wallace said, would be the deepest and most radical review of UK foreign and security and defence policy since the end of the Cold War. Um, but as um, <clears throat> Ben Wallace's comment implies, there have obviously been previous reviews. And the question that I want to ask is, well, compared with what? And those four previous reviews were 1990 to 91, 97, 98, 2010 and 2015. And there have been many mini reviews of aspects of defense and other aspects of national security. Within the last three years alone, we have seen the National Security Capability Review and the Modernizing Defense Program. So national security has not lacked reviews um, over the uh, past 30 years. But how does one assess a national security review? Not only whether it was to use the labeling deep and radical, but whether it reached the right conclusions and took the right decisions. Reviews always end well. People still shudder at mentions of the Defence Review of 1957, known as the Sands Review, after the then Defence Minister. So as a former senior official in the Ministry of Defence, I obviously speak this evening uh, in a strictly personal capacity. But drawing on our experience of the last four reviews, 
some former colleagues and I have been developing an analytical framework to try to answer the question that I've just posed. And we've focused on the defense aspects, but there may be read across to the other dimensions too. Our proposed five tests, if I could borrow a phrase, are obviously work in progress, and so I'd welcome your feedback. But first, just a quick reminder of those last four reviews and their circumstances. So options for change carried out in 1989-90 as communism and the Warsaw Pact collapsed in Eastern Europe, and that resulted in a major reduction in the size of the UK's armed forces. The Strategic Defence Review carried out in 97-98 by the incoming Labour government, this reset defence policy and planning towards a quote expeditionary unquote approach and capabilities. Then the Strategic Defence and Security Review of 2010 carried out in the wake of the financial crisis of 20, 2008. And this sought to set a higher bar for quote expeditionary unquote operations after Iraq and Afghanistan and to address some serious overheating in the defence equipment programme. And then the Strategic Defence and Security Review of 2015, carried out in accordance with the 2010 decision that such review should occur on a regular five-year cycle. That review was arguably the first integrated review looking at national security and defence in the round, not least in the wake of a resurgent Russia. So the current integrated review is also happening, as it were, on time, but also of course, as the first review after the UK's departure from the EU. So as Karen has noted, the government has set publicly some high level outcomes for the review, all to be underpinned by a reformed and refocused approach to defence. I mean, frankly, we'll struggle to assess the review's conclusions and decisions against the publicly stated goals, particularly in the short term, Indeed, at least two of those high level outcomes are beyond the reach of any British government. More constructively, if more prosaically, one can try to assess whether the integrated review will deliver the policies, plans, capabilities and systems that will rise to the foreseeable security challenges and whether those, re those responses are adequately resourced. So within our, that construct, our five tests are, and I'll just go through them in order, the risk and threat assessment and the resulting policy baseline. With hindsight, how good were the review's assessment of how the threats and risks to our security might evolve? How well did they then inform the policy baseline? And how does the IR, the integrated review, compare them? Secondly, the policy and planning responses. How successful over time were the previous review's key national security and defense policy and planning responses? How does the IR, the integrated review, compare in terms of degree and imagination? The capability and force structure outcomes. With hindsight, were the changes made to capability and force structures by reviews the right ones? What are the big choices for the integrated review and how do they compare? Fourth, the shape of the financial settlement. What adjustments were made and not made to the defence budget in previous reviews? and one could expand that to national security budget. With hindsight, were sufficient efforts made to achieve a balance between policy and commitments on one hand and resources on the other? Will a sustainable balance emerge from the integrated review? And then finally, organization and systems. Did any organizational changes result from those reviews that produced the desired effect? Will the integrated review go beyond the FCO DFID merger and address other structural and process issues. So having set out my five tests, let's look at the scorecard and start to set some benchmarks for the integrated review. To illustrate the approach in the time available, I'll briefly apply two of the tests to just two or three of the reviews. So test one, the risk and threat assessment and the policy baseline. Previous reviews didn't do that badly, perhaps despite what Christopher has just said. Uh, options for change judged it prudent to reduce defence spending from about 4% to about 2.5% of GDP over the subsequent decade. And so it was. The threat of major conflict in Europe receded over that period and beyond. 20 years later, SDSR 2010 limited defence's ambitions in terms of the scale of discretionary operations 
and took calculated risk on certain capabilities. That was painful, but was manageable for several years thereafter. SDSR 2015 closed these capability gaps, reorientated defense planning onto state-based threats, and deepened investment in the new domains such as cyber and space. So by and large, these reviews were about right on the trajectory of risks and threats and in terms of their baseline policy responses. But the later ones significantly underestimated how quickly the character of conflict, to pick up uh, Christopher's term, would evolve, particularly the innovative exploitation of commercial technologies. The integrated review, as Christopher set out, is addressing an international context more unpredictable and dangerous than any time in the 30 years. So the clarity of the risk assessment and the quality of the headline response, policy response, will be a critical first test of whether it's met mark. So then test four, the shape of the financial settlement. A mixed story, if I could put it that way. By 97, 98, the defense budget was at a low point in real terms, with little hope of an uplift given the then government's ambitious social agenda. That SDR concluded that a residual gap between the associated financial settlement and the estimated cost of the defense program could be closed by ambitious efficiency targets. The result was that the MOD struggled financially throughout the next decade. The 2010 SDSR <clears throat> cut both the defense program and the defense budget, but it soon became apparent that it hadn't gone far enough. Hence, 2011 saw a previously rejected reduction in the size of the army, a uh, decision to uh, carry that out. 2015 began, 2015 SDSR began with a commitment to meet NATO's defense spending target of 2% of GDP thus essentially fixing the budget at the outset. But the review then strained the envelope through new additions to the defense program, with the gap to be closed, as in 97-98, by ambitious efficiency targets. This again has left the MOD struggling financially. So the test here for the integrated review will be quite simply whether it provides a financial platform sound enough to carry the weight of the future defense program. And as I said, we we'll could broaden that out to national security more, more widely. Applying this test shouldn't be too difficult. We should look for a continuing commitment to at least 0.5% real annual growth in the defense budget over the next uh, CSR period and treat with suspicion any announcements about new efficiency targets. And given the stated desire in the MOD's integrated operating concept uh, published just last week to invest in new, quote, sunrise, unquote, technologies, we should look for clear commitments to remove sunset capabilities with lesser utility in the new operating environment. So in conclusion, <clears throat> the integrated review is being conducted in unique and very challenging circumstances. It needs to be deep and radical, as the Defence Secretary has said. And I would contend that using the tests I've outlined, or something similar, it will be possible to assess pretty quickly whether or not it has met that ambition effectively. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thanks very much. Yes, so we have um, a, a test for the test. And, you know, <laughs> how do we assess the assessment? Um, so now next up is Susan uh, Schofield, who I believe has been able to join us. Yes, indeed. Great. Over to you, Susan. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, I've listened with great interest to all that Peter has just said, and would agree. I heard most of what Christopher said, um, and also strongly um, would agree with the scale of our challenge now. Um, so just to say, I too am speaking in a personal capacity, of course, but coming at this perhaps from a slightly different angle, having been a, a former head of the Civil Contingencies Secretariat in the Cabinet Office, but I stress I speak uh, tonight in a very personal capacity. Um, I think the challenge that is facing this country and, well, all countries at the moment, is indeed uh, almost unprecedented um, in its scale, in its scope, 
and in the importance of finding a way through. So it's interesting and I hope that the Defence and Security Review Integrated will rise to the challenges perhaps which have been more familiar to us. I think what faces us now, we are indeed at a tipping point. I can just explain what I mean. Um, bet, being very sort of narrow, I, I think the, the challenge nationally of Brexit and then coronavirus tests us very severely. And that would be without the political uh, tensions which colleagues have also been setting out. Now, um, I could answer, uh, and we'll start by answering um, some of the questions by narrowly how are we doing um, on the test of coping with coronavirus. And indeed, as Christopher said, this is not actually as unfamiliar as we're finding it. We have been here before. We did cope globally better with SARS and other events similarly. Um, but we are struggling nationally with this one and we are not alone. Um, key steps, I think, to maximise our resilience in the future to other such natural hazards and as significant, but we hadn't been thinking in those terms, and I entirely agree, to malicious threats maybe just below the, the sort of war fighting threshold that we've been used to thinking in terms of. So what should we do? Well, quite, quite basically, um, we've forgotten, I think, some of the, the fundamentals. Um, we really should update our resilience plans regularly uh, so that the government departments in this country and agencies and actors at all levels, I mean, regional and local as well, have clearly identified um, Who's going to do what? And how are we going to cope with low probability but high impact events? So um, yes, diseases of people, animal and plants. Indeed, um, chemical, biological, radiological accidents and attacks. We've had those last year. Um, mass casualties, fatalities, evacuations in general and informing, alerting and warning the public. For me, actually, austerity in this country has undermined, I would say, our national resilience, um, quite as we are discovering severely. I trust not catastrophically, I think we can put it right. We need, therefore, to resource those lead actors um, in several ways, actually a little bit more imaginatively than we've been thinking of, um, to enable active horizon scanning, you know, so that we can be preparing, um, protecting ourselves against and ideally preventing the next big thing which may coincide. Um, so uh, we are coinciding, conceivably, um, Brexit, no deal at worst case. And then it's winter, which is always tough. We're already seeing fl flooding and we might get flu as well as continuing coronavirus. Can we talk, can we actually cope with all that at the same time? Um, so we need to resource. Um, actually, as, as the Chancellor has been saying, almost whatever the cost in the short term, um, to do that active horizon scanning at the same time as all of the above, invest in the latest technologies, update our stockpiles, make sure our supply chains are resilient, not least food, um, fuel, energy, medicines, etc. And we do need a prudent level of redundancy in, in my view, and this is absolutely critical, to eliminate single points of failure, i.e. jargon for you know, the one thing that you can put out and the whole system comes crashing down. Power cuts, haha, <laughs> to see one. Um, the destructive effect that that could have nationally. 
So the problem for me with austerity is, if you like, you have um, efficiency cutting out duplication. But is that effective or is it economy that could lead you into disaster? We also actually, again, to be really, really basic, need to exercise those plans regularly, not only at the national, but at the regional, the local levels, um, to build and sustain the good working relations and coordination, understand and develop the working practices, consider how existing institutions can be adapted rapidly for new and hitherto unseen changes, rather than trying to create a new organisation in the middle of a crisis to do something which is really important. Could I be talking, for example, test and trace? Um, so, um, another thing I actually think is basic but quite important is that ministers should be involved in those exercises. There's been a habit of delegating to others. But the people who are actually going to have to do this come the day, as we see our ministers. It's most important, collectively, uh, also that we understand the impact of hazards and threats on different parts of the country and the people who live there, both regions, um, the nations that make up uh, this United Kingdom, and uh, at the very local level. And actually, we should share those results and the lessons we learn promptly unless there are very good reasons for confidentiality, i.e. threats and vulnerabilities we really don't want to make clear to foreign powers or non-state actors. We need to keep those plans updated. I know it sounds boring and unnecessary, but we can see it is not, it is critical for our national uh, resilience in every sense. Um, actually, we can do this. If we look at SARS, I would also say, uh, in this country events in Salisbury on the 4th of March 2018. I'm talking about Skripal. Um, subsequently, the way we handled that at national, regional, local level is instructive, actually, and uh, in many of the key respects, and actually several others, it's really interesting to look back. Um, but what we've got to do, we other countries who care about these things, We've got to build a whole society approach now to tackling these challenges in the way we perhaps haven't realised we needed to do before. Um, we've got to do our best to ensure that economic, social, psychological impact on everyone is both fair and widely accepted as fair. So when we set our macroeconomic, our industrial, our employment, indeed our environmental, as Christopher says, our social and social security policies, our employment policies, um, government should continue to provide state support. I do think we have to now, particularly to level up the disadvantaged until a stable new normal is achieved. So departments should continue to work closely with financial bodies, universities and think tanks, professional bodies, trade associations, trade unions, other third sector, grassroots partners to take account of the impact on large, medium and small businesses, the self-employed, those who are in work and those who are not. And, uh, you know, should we start thinking about things like a universal basic wage? Could a four-day working week become the norm in the public sector, creating new job opportunities? We know, we've been saying, haven't we, we need to get children and young people back into full-time education and then into jobs, and that's going to need flexibility, imagination, and underline careful management. Um, I mean, could we uh, be thinking more, we've got Kickstart, line up with Prince's Trust, um, even could the National Citizen Service, I haven't heard a lot about that uh, recently, uh, bridge the gap. Where can we create more funded work experience, bursaries and ex apprenticeships? It's got to be funded work experience. It can't just be if your family can afford to let you show up and then you go away and you haven't been paid. Nasty examples of that we're hearing of now. Um, I mean, more generally, 
how can the large number of well-off, retired but physically active people be encouraged to contribute more to well-being of our nation as a whole? Um, we need, I think, actually to have a radical review, for example, about you know, such people and others paying their fair share of tax. And it's interesting to see already there's considerable discussion about us putting in place um, long overdue tax simplification that this country has needed for a very long time. But to how we replace then the immediate state funding with actually a taxation system that delivers the financing, which is absolutely key in all of this. And thinking as carefully about that as other things. Um, we have also got to address delayed reforms of health and especially social care. Again, must be fully funded. Um, taking account of different needs of the young, working age adults, older people, and particularly the vulnerable at each stage of life. I come back to mental health of all of us. And so to seize the opportunity, let's be positive, <laughs> of the current crisis, we should build on all of these and many other ideas, often from the bottom up. One size will not fit all, and local communities and authorities are essential partners in this levelling up. Metro mayors are the regional partners are well placed to help lead and help those lead departments engage with such local actors and coordinated the activity. Um, I'm really talking about every department, every business and household should review our business continuity plan. Um, whatever the context of this, we've all got to do it, whether, whether the business um, is the national government or the company small, medium, large, or indeed our own family and our own households. We all need this kind of resilience now, in a way and far more greatly perhaps than we ever have before. And I will finish there, thank you. Right, thank you very much. All right, so I think um, what strikes me is the scale of the challenge. <laughs> <laughs> ahead. Um, so uh, all of you have sort of um, uh, addressed this. What I was wondering whether I could get uh, you all to think to sort of kind of consider the extent to which this can be done by the UK alone. In other words, how should this should the review um, consider the, consider where and with whom the UK should work um, internationally, which should be the privileged um, institutions that it should work with, what happens if there is a no deal Brexit and that kind of makes some um, foreign and security cooperation with foreign policy and security cooperation with the EU very difficult and so on. So I wonder if I could just go, we might be able to go in the, the order that um, that we I began with. So. Um, Christopher, is this a job for the UK alone, or do you think that they are going to the review should um, incorporate extensively the international co cooperation that, in fact, you mentioned? Well, I think if you go back to Peter's um, tour d'horizon of uh, defence reviews since 1957, they've all been predicated on cooperation uh, mm -hmm. and international cooperation. But I think the difference is that they have specifically targeted the United States. This was the one key partner that we were going to work with. And uh, we face a problem that I tried to uh, touch upon very briefly by saying that the United States is no long, longer the superpower or the hegemonic power that it was, either by choice or by reality. Um, but it, it's clear that we have a president who sees alliances and allies in transactional terms. Um, and no longer in terms of values. Um, that was the old uh, raison d'etre for working so closely with the United States during the Cold War, indeed immediately afterwards, the, the Bush-Blair partnership, for example, was very, very much touted, whether it was real or not, as a value-related uh, um, uh, alignment uh, in a new war uh, against terrorism. The other thing is, I think, uh, we face a, a prospect, another problem as a European country, and we are, fundamentally a European country, whatever our global aspirations may be, in that the United States sees its principal uh, rival uh, and strategic threat as China, 
and the European Union uh, basically sees the main military threat to come from Russia. Now, I realize the European Union has identified China as a systemic uh, challenge uh, to its hopes and aspirations. And of course, we're no longer a member of the European Union and we won't be anyway on January the 1st. But we are basically a European power, whether we like it or not. It's what, what Churchill said, oh, the political weather comes from Europe. That was his famous uh, quotation. The political weather comes from Europe. And that is why for us, as um, Susan mentioned, uh, looking at Skripal and Salisbury poisonings, Russia is uh, the number one challenge. And, and we have been, I think, more uh, resilient, to use that term, in dealing with Russia than most other European countries, in fact. But in dealing with Salisbury and Skripal, we had almost united European support behind us. And that was an enormous success story for the British government and for Boris Johnson, actually, because he was Foreign Secretary at the time, I believe, uh, in being able to get that degree of support against Russia, the expelling Russian diplomats, um, accepting uh, British government's evidence, etc., etc., etc. So I think this is what we have. I would say, um, looking at the bright side, because I've been accused of pessimism, and indeed, quite <laughs> rightly so, because I'm not paid to be optimistic, I'm paid to be pessimistic. Now that we are no longer a member of the European Union and we can't block uh, common security and foreign policy in the way that we, we used to, or at least drag, drag, be a drag on it, um, we can actually be more pro, uh, proactively European than we have before. And I think this, was, this is Macron's understanding of the relationship between Britain and France. That yes, we're outside the European Union, but it's Europe plus one the EU plus one, and that one is the United Kingdom. And I sincerely hope that we will uh, be more proactively European than we have been before, putting this era of expeditionary warfare in Afghanistan and Iraq behind us as yesterday's agenda and not tomorrow's. My only concern uh, with the review itself is that the language may not uh, reflect this, but the language may be more, I wouldn't say anti-European, but more lacklustre uh, in its support for our European role because of Brexit, because of the need for the government to be shown to be solidly, you know, for the global uh, UK um, alternative. So I think um, on balance, I, I hope the integrated review will reaffirm the fact that without international cooperation, we're not global or anything. And that essentially our main uh, allies in future have actually to be the Europeans. But the key issue, and then I'll end it here because I've gone beyond my time, is I think going to be China, because the United States will expect a far more robust position. You are with us or you're against us, will be the mentality. You're with us on China or you're against us in China. And of course the Chinese can overplay their hand very easily and make sure that the Europeans are at the American court. But I think you'll find that most countries of the world, in Asia and Europe, don't wish to be cho faced with this uh, uh, bi bi binary choice of your with us or against us, but are trying to, in, in essence, try to um, follow a balanced uh, position in all of this. And that's going to be the real challenge for the next few years. Great, thank you. I mean, I was just struck also by, you know, this, the high level outcomes include a more resilient world. I mean, how can the UK do that on its own? <laughs> but yeah, I mean, extraordinary, um, extraordinary uh, expectation that the UK is able to do that. Anyway, over, over to you, Peter. Well, I don't think I've, I've got a lot to add to what Christopher said. I mean, the basic answer to your question is, of course, yes. <clears throat> UK can only achieve what it wants to achieve or and the various goals in the um, you know, in, in the integrated review call for evidence that you, you quoted from uh, by working uh, very closely with other countries. Now, you know, who knows how the um, US election is going to turn out. <clears throat> but in either event, I think the United States will expect the European countries, including the UK, to do more for their own security. I mean, the US faces a big challenge on the other side of the planet, which will increasingly its attention and that will happen regardless of who wins on the 3rd of November. So <clears throat> the, the UK is going to have to uh, focus uh, on Euro-Atlantic security. Um, it's a area where we can actually make a difference. We don't have enormous armed forces but they are significant and they can make a difference in that theatre. And so 
we should be doing what actually started in the wake of the 2015 review, which was something called International by Design. Uh, I think it's now been renamed Allied by Design, but it's the same concept, which is working much more closely from the get-go, as it were, with our um, allies and partners. That should be a sort of base assumption rather than something that we do only when we've realised we've run out of money or capability on our own. <clears throat> so I would like to see the review deepening that multilateral and bilateral cooperation that we've got going uh, with the Nordic Baltic countries, with Germany, with France, with Romania and so on. And in terms of what we'll do further afield, because I think we will have to do more further afield, we should do so um, in conjunction with our uh, allies and partners and friends in the region, Australia, Japan, the Republic of Korea, Singapore, etc. And we can, we can work more closely with them in, a num in, in various ways, which was sort of hinted at in the uh, MOD document last week, but could be unpacked. And I think my, my point would be to pick up something that Christopher said. Um, I'm sp I think I'm less worried about anti-European language. I think I'm more worried about rather sort of grandiloquent language uh, being used in the review, which might make it more difficult for people to um, cooperate with us. So I, I would li I'd like to see some quite measured language about what the UK can achieve on its own and what it can do uh, together with uh, allies, partners and friends. Great, thank you. Right, Susan, would you like to? I'd like very much to uh, agree um, with what Peter's just said, and, and indeed with what um, Christopher was saying. I mean, again, my answer is yes, we must. Uh, I think the challenge for us is that that uh, may not be enough. I'd like to see us acting as a force for good, contributing and so forth, back to that theme. But uh, my concern is actually we may need to do some of this by ourselves. We need to choose very carefully um, what those things are, but I think we shouldn't assume we can look to others to ensure our critical national infrastructure, if I can put it in those terms, uh, and our national um, security is something we can sort of leave to others, because I fear we cannot. And perhaps I'll stop there. Okay, great. All right, so everyone, if you have um, questions, please send them via the Q&A. Um, I've got to start, we do have a question from one of our LSE students, Mara, who's asked, what role does Brexit play uh, in this review of, of the UK foreign security defense and uh, development policy? Does anyone want to take that um, question? We've mentioned it a few times, but... Mm -hmm. um, wondering if anyone wants to say anything more about the role that... Well, I, I, perhaps I could just play. open. Um, I mean, obviously, in two key respects. I mean, one is, um, it is, it will be necessary, and the government said this many times, to redefine the UK's role in the world. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't mean that it has to be somehow anti-European or less concerned about Europe. Um, because, um, you know, as Christopher has set out, we are basically a European country and the security of our Euro-Atlantic neighbourhood is rather important. So that it, but defining that role and doing so in language that everybody can, as it were, move mind, I think is extremely important. And it plays to Susan's point about resilience. I mean, how can I put it? Perhaps the UK feels a bit rough at the moment. Um, <clears throat> you know, we need that statement of um, sort of, you know, if you like a compass telling us where we're going. And I think so the, the review can do that and I, I hope it will do that. Um, the other thing that I think is important is that in my view, one of the key themes for the review should be something we used to call economic security. Mm. Um, because, you know, we used to sort of not worry about economic security. We had globalization and trade and it was all fine, but um, it doesn't look so good anymore. And of course, one key change with Brexit is, and, and whether you support it or don't support it, is that we can now pursue our own trade policy. So we can link 
security and economic policy in a way that we either couldn't do or didn't do uh, in the past. So I think those two factors I would be the ones I would highlight. <clears throat> Anyone else want to come in? Um, well, I just make um, three, three very short points about this. I, I think what's striking for me is how um, proactively European um, the um, British government has been in defence and security terms in the last few years. Now, whether this is in response to Brexit, uh, whether this is the need to be shown to be more proactively European or not, I don't know. But if you're looking at, for example, very close defence relationship that is built up with Romania, in the last few years, or with the Baltic states, where we're taking a kind of primary concern for the defense of the Baltics. Um, that seems to me to be admirably European uh, of us. Um, and again, whether this is response to Brexit or not, um, I'm not sure it is, but I just want to say that Brexit doesn't, I think, in any way invalidate uh, the British government's um, commitment to the defense of Europe. The second thing is geography. We have discovered, rediscovered the importance of geography. You may recall, Karen, many years ago, there was an Economist cover, famous covers of the Economist magazine, the death of distance. Distance had gone, it didn't matter. You know, sea routes didn't matter, choke points didn't matter. Uh, it was all globalization. It was all very, very global. Well, it's not. And whether you're looking at Libya or whether you're looking at what happened in the Eastern Mediterranean recently between Greece or Turkey, or ask the Baltic states about the death of, of distance, ask the Russians about the death of distance. One of the reasons for Russian behavior is that we've ignored the importance of the fact that Ukraine is only you know, 300 miles away from uh, Moscow. So for them, Distance is extremely important, as it is for the Chinese in the South China Seas. So I think we are, whether we like it or not, forced to be primarily a European power, uh, with or without Brexit. My third uh, last point would be about resilience. Um, this is a term which is, which is a fascinating term. A book came out on resilience some years ago by two, I think, American authors, 2015, called Resilience. And they were trying to come up with a principal definition of what resilience actually means. And they came up with one that appeals to me. I'm not in the business of resilience, unlike Susan, but it appeals to me as a punter. And that is that resilience is maintaining the core purpose of the enterprise or the edifice uh, after it's been challenged. So is a bridge still standing after a hurricane? Is a human being still resilient enough uh, after a traumatic event? Or is the human being suffering from post-traumatic trauma, for example? And the resilience of an alliance, it seems to me, is, 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 is finding its core purpose. And it seems to me, going back to Churchill's days in the 1930s, when he said, you know, that our, our, our frontier was the Rhine, basically, we are a European power first, second and third. And that doesn't in any way, of course, uh, mitigate against uh, the importance of the Indian Ocean and our commitments to, to that, our, our, our five uh, power agreement uh, in, in Southeast Asia. But we are first, second, and third a European power, because that is geographically, historically, and culturally where our interests are to be defined, whether or not we are a member of the European Union. And I think it's something that the European Union will be able to deal with in its own way after the initial fraught, and there will be very fraught, first or second years after Brexit. Susan? I would just like to add that if we can, there are some things I think we, we should do on a global basis, working well with World Health Organization, for example, on coronavirus. I mean, for me, that, that is, under pr present circumstances, absolutely the ideal. But we need to be prepared for not all wishing to play or being able for whatever reason to do so and might have to narrow those that we work with. But I think there are those kind of examples where an international approach in the global sense is still valid if we can achieve it. But I don't think we advance our cause um, by, um, as Peter has said, this um, grandiloquent language. Um, it's, uh, it's very annoying, particularly if we aren't solving some problems particularly well ourselves at the moment. I think a little humility would assist our international uh, influence. Thank Great, thanks very much. All right, so we have some que another question from, I believe from an LSE student, um, Gedan, who um, has, a, I think, um, pretty uh, uh, question 
directed to Christopher, but um, all of you might want to um, to address it. Um, who who asked whether international cooperation is a necessary condition to solve climate change? Mm. In other words, countries could race to the top. So the you know so the recent Chinese declaration that it's going to be completely you know, it's going to uh, be less to, to completely independent of um, fossil fuels by 2060, decarbonize the, the economy and so on. That's, that's a, a unilateral um, policy that it's taken. So could, in other words, could it be a kind of um, race to the top by various countries almost acting autonomously, independently, that could help solve climate change? Would one need international cooperation? I don't know, Chris, it was directed to you, Christopher, but I am, so we could start with you, but then anybody else could come in as they want. Well, I think the environment, like anything else, um, will be increasingly politicized uh, as countries um, squabble between themselves to prove their environmental credentials and also to occupy the commanding heights. Um, the second thing I'd say is that uh, geopolitics uh, enters into uh, the environmental agenda as well. It can enter into the environmental agenda. You can play geopolitical games. My reading, as someone who is um, in no way uh, an expert on this at all, is that the crisis has hit us already you know, and, uh, and that it's irreversible and that the damage has already been done and that more damage will be done in future if there's not uh, global cooperation uh, on a scale. And this is my concern about a G zero world. You may remember at the environmental conference in Copenhagen several years ago, the Chinese and the Americans invited the European Union to leave the room, which came as a big surprise to the European Union, on the grounds that they, there would be a G two world and the, these two countries would solve the crisis. Well, these are the two biggest polluters uh, on the planet. And so uh, I suppose logically it would follow that if they could find common cause and agreement, they could solve the problem. But unfortunately they can't solve the problem on their own. It is a global problem at every single level and time is running out. And the students that I used to teach, uh, what, two years ago now, I mean, for them, the environment was, the main thing and I would give my lectures on NATO and uh, the coming war between the United States and China all of which I believe is, is, is quite likely by the way not probable but but possible let's not say likely and they would look you know they're starry-eyed and they would say no, but it's the environment and this is our, our future and it's a global problem the problem we face is that unfortunately the main uh, great powers of the world and I exclude the European Union uh, from this it's not a power as such and I may aspire to be one is they don't see it in that way at all. Uh, they are still competing against each other for advantage. Uh, and that advantage is at the expense of the global commons, the environment. So when the Chinese talk about being uh, uh, an Arctic member, because they see the Arctic as the global commons, and the Russians say, no, wait a minute, uh, you know, this is our uh, area. We are the main geopolitical uh, a person in the, in the uh, Arctic, which they are, because they own 60% of it. Uh, and, and with global warming, they'll own 70% of it, uh, as you get to uh, uh, de thawing, et cetera. You're, you're here in, in a case in point of a, of a so-called growing alliance between Russia and China, where they're talking a totally different language about a very important area for all of us, exceptionally important area, the Arctic. So I'm, I, I'm a little skeptical um, uh, about um, national policies on environmental issues. I, I, I don't think they'll get off the ground, uh, quite frankly. It's got to be a global response. And that is becoming increasingly unlikely, unfortunately, as tensions, and as I say, the stress testing of alliances um, grows. Uh, and of course, the, 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 the present administration in the United States, which doesn't seem to think that the environment is the number one challenge that we all face. Great. Susan, you wanted to come in. Well, if I might, yes. Um, here is an opportunity again for the UK. Um, we've got the COP26 now deferred to November 2021 in Glasgow. Is this not a wonderful opportunity for us to work with nations across the world to exactly address that enormous existential crisis for us all. 
we're having the classic Zoom problems. I'm not even sure if it's on my my fault or um, my internet or just like you know the 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 internet of the world, as it were. Um, I'm sorry. Karen, it says um, your bandwidth but, is um, low. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I'll turn off my video in a second. But um, there was a, there are a couple more questions. We've only got about 10 more minutes. And there was a question um, from Robert Cooper, who knows a thing or two about um, writing strategies for Susan in particular, about resilience, wanting to know whether, um, uh, which countries do you think uh, do well on resilience? So, you know, what are the kind of the models that the UK could use? Um, and his favorites are Finland, Denmark, and Taiwan. Um, and then I'm just going to give another couple of questions just um, and then you can take them um, as it were from Christos, who's an LSC student. Um, are we entering an, an era of deglobalization? And would one response to that be increased uh, regional uh, cooperation? So just a couple questions there. Perhaps, Susan, you want to start with um, the, yes. the resilience? you know, which ones should we be looking at? I do think the Nordic countries, I must say. Um, I think in some respects also the Netherlands. Uh, Peter, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, I'll start on that one actually, because um, actually that was a subject of a previous um, LSC Ideas webinar that um, I took part in. I think the answer to the question is that probably we've seen the end to what one might call uber globalization. Um, I think there will be more concern in future about the security of supply chains and so on. But um, as we discussed in that previous webinar, there'd already been signs of a retreat from that before the, um, the pandemic hit. And there are signs that driven by various factors, including uh, new technologies like additive manufacturing and so on. Um, there, it's more economical now to do things um, at home or indeed on a regional basis. So I don't think we're going to see, you know, a simple, you know, end to globalization in a sort of simplistic way. But I think there will be a degree of rebalancing towards uh, more regional and even national arrangements. Christopher, did you? Are we uh, well, I don't. Um, it's possible to stop globalization um, if we had a pandemic far more serious than this one, uh, for example. And this pandemic isn't going to stop globalization. I think we have to draw, draw a distinction between arresting globalization and reversing it. And if you go back historically, uh, it depends when you start dating it. I, I think most um, economists would probably start dating it from the mid 19th century, but many historians would date it from three, four, five hundred years. The Chinese would date it far further back than that. Um, the Great Silk Road, for example, is a wonderful example of globalization, which uh, over 1500 years. Um, but you can reverse it. Uh, you, sorry, you can arrest it. And it was arrested in the 1930s. And one of the results of that, of course, was the, was the Second World War. You had ideologies that were anti-globalization ideologies. Um, and, and, and we are seeing the rise of anti-globalization ideologies now, now, but they are very, very fringe and they haven't captured political power in, in any uh, country. I mean, e even in Brazil, I would suggest they haven't captured political power as such. Um, but um, deglobalization, do you mean by that um, the end of the liberal world order, which is a very different concept? And what we are seeing with China is the rise of regional um, organizations, whether it's the Shanghai Coordination Council, it's Development Bank, Asia Development Bank, etc. These are parallel organizations, but I don't think they're deglobalized organizations. It's just a different way of looking at globalization and, 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 and making sure that it's not anchored to what the Chinese would see as the American uh, hegemonic world in which they decide what conditionality clauses are and everything else, the old Washington consensus, for example. Whether there's a Beijing consensus or not, which people talk about, I think is, is questionable at the moment. I don't think there is a Beijing consensus, but there is definitely a, a more pluralistic uh, world order coming out uh, into view, which I don't think is deglobalization at all. It's just a different version of globalization from the Western one that we have been become so used to in the last 150 years. Okay, I, I think, great, thanks. I think we have lost um, uh, Susan. It is the sort of these, you know, these little bugs that are in the 
the system on Zoom in one hand is wonderful, and on the other hand, it's annoying that it doesn't work all the time. Um, but there is another, I'm going to follow up with another question actually from uh, Robert Cooper, who, um, who asks um, whether the UK government uh, is, uh, the UK political system is in good enough shape to deal with these large questions. Well, I'll, I'll go if you want. Um, I would highlight two things that need some attention. Um, and there's nothing original in what I'm about to say. Um, it's been said by many people. One is that um, I think our governmental structures and processes, particularly in England, are too centralized. And that has been shown, I think, uh, by the, uh, the pandemic. So there needs to be a degree of decentralization within a coherent framework. And at the moment, um, you know, I mean, work needs to be done to set that framework out. The other one, which is <clears throat> slightly more um, intangible, is around the political culture, which is very adversarial. Um, and I think if we're going to sort of pull together in the way that Susan was setting out, I think we're going to need to try and develop a more consultative political culture. Um, you know, a little bit along the German model. Um, you know, we've given up uh, admiring Rhineland capitalism, but it's quite noticeable during the last few months how much um, people in this country have admired the way that Germany has gone about uh, dealing with the pandemic. So those are, I think, two things that um, I would say need a bit of attention if the uh, UK is to uh, survive in the, in the new world. We did, we did and just uh, before you before you go, Peter, there was an, another question just on sort of the extent to which um, the austerity might have played a role here. In other words, you know, how how has this weakened the UK's ability to to deal with these sorts of challenges? Um, well, Susan's the expert on this, but um, I think, as she said, the, the austerity combined with the drive for efficiency meant that um, you know a lot of the redundancy in the system um, and in, you know particularly around stockpiling and all of that stuff was taken out and we need to find a, a way of putting that back in which has a proper sort of intellectual basis and doesn't just appear to be duplication and waste so i think austerity has uh, played a part um, but you know and that's going to, that will need to be corrected and i think that's the government's intention it's no like we're no longer just in time you know it's just in time sort of trade we can't do that any longer because that's the margins are too short um you know the the time the time <clears throat> between sort of turning things over at ports and whatnot is far too short anyway christopher over to you uh no i just make a, a kind of party political point here um rather than anything profound i mean i i would echo as many people would I'm sure listening to this discussion, what Peter said about Germany, I mean, it's quite clear that governance in Germany is in far better shape than it is in the UK. And that we have a great deal to learn, I think, not just from Germany, but from other countries, uh, Finland, for example, others have been mentioned. They're all very different from the UK. Um, so I'm, I'm in no doubt about the differences of culture and history, uh, etc. But I mean, the party political point is what, well, this is what happens when you, you, you don't allow your first division players to play and you put your second division players in the cabinet. Uh, and that goes back to Peter's point about adversarial politics. But the adversarial politics used to be between parties, but it's now inside a party. It's inside the Conservative Party. And so we've got the government that we deserve, um, which is a second, a second division government. It's as simple as that. And whether things will change after Brexit, after it's been done, when it would be possible perhaps to invite some of the uh, Remainers back into the cabinet, that may be possible. Um, but I don't see it under this Prime Minister uh, and under his, uh, under Dominic Cummings, but I do see it under his successor. And we, things might be better by then. Better to wait for that than for a vaccine that may never come. <laughs> We're all baiting our breath on that one, boy. All right, great. So we've run out of time. So I'd like to thank our panelists, Peter, Christopher, and Susan, very much for their um, their erudition. And um, I, I have to say a little bit of pessimism on, on, on some parts. I'm not sure that I feel particularly um, 
Yeah, I think I'll need a little sort of drink before I go to bed just to, go <laughs> to, to, to cheer myself up. Uh, but um, as it's uh, the, in the chat, as is noted, um, there's a short feedback form. It's going to appear in your browser um, when you um, uh, close this, close down this event. And we'd appreciate it if you would uh, fill that out. Um, so thank you very much for joining us uh, today. And thanks very much to our panelists and LSE Ideas for putting this on. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye.